John Piper said, one of the great enemies of hope is forgetting the promises of God. Church, we can go through life's most difficult circumstances. We can go through life's most difficult circumstances if we remember the promises of God. Like balm for a wearied soul, like water for a parched mouth, and like food for a hungry stomach are the promises of God for the believer enduring trials. There's a hymn I used to sing often growing up at First Baptist Coldwater. The second line of the hymn says, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Church, when you have nowhere else to cling to, nothing to grab a hold of, and no one to encourage you. There is always a rock underneath your feet if you are a believer in Jesus, and it's Jesus himself. Today, we are back in the book of Acts. At the end of a series that we have titled The Church in Motion. And I say the end because this journey started in October of 2020. And so as we continue our march and as we near the end of this incredible book study, we find ourselves today looking at this idea of standing on the promises of God. As we find Paul in the middle of a riot and on trial. You see, in our passage today, we find the same Jesus who stood on our place on the cross also stands beside us in our troubles. And if I could take these verses and deduce it down to one sentence, I would tell you that the main theme of this passage is that God's promises bring comfort and peace during life's most trying times. And so my prayer this week for today is that regardless of where you are in this life, regardless of what has gone on in your life this past week, month, or year, that you will find hope in the promises of God. And so let's take a moment and let's set our passage in its proper context. The book of Acts was written to show you and I the expansion of the early church through the Acts of the Apostles. It is a story of how God took normal everyday people living normal everyday life and how he worked through their lives to expand the kingdom. It should be an encouragement to every believer who thinks, how can God use me? We should go to this text, go to this book, and see how God took 11 men who were fragile at best, who had no skills, no buildings, no theological education, no missionary training, and how God took these 11 men and how he turned the world upside down with him or with them. The first few chapters of the book, we see God sending out the apostles. Then we see the establishment of the church in chapter two. We see the expansion of that church. We see the persecution that comes from Paul and his friends to the church and how God used that persecution to expand the church even beyond the boundaries of Jerusalem on out to Samaria. And how after Paul's conversion, how God sent Paul to be a part of a Gentile mission as Gentiles were then coming to faith in Christ, professing faith. It stirred up such a controversy that the Jerusalem council had to sit down with Paul and all the elders and discuss what does it take for someone to be saved? And the resounding response to that question was faith in Christ is by the grace that Christ offers and it's according to the scriptures. That's how we are converted. And so Paul goes on these missionary journeys 
And on his last journey, the third missionary journey, he makes his way through Macedonia and Achaia, and he's making his way through that region to collect funds from, this, from these Gentile churches in order to bring relief back to the saints who were at Jerusalem because they, they, had, they had suffered so much as a result of the gospel's work in their life, they were suffering economically. And so Paul wanted to bring relief to their suffering. He also wanted to bring healing to this church, a church that was still divided along Jewish and non-Jewish lines. Paul gets back to Jerusalem, and what does he find in Jerusalem? He finds a church that is still holding on to Jewish law and Jewish customs. He realizes that the divide is more than just racial divide. It is a theological divide. And as Paul begins to share the gospel, as Paul does what the men ask him to do, to be cleansed before coming back out and speaking with them, he's dragged off last week. In our text we looked at last week, he's, he's dragged off and he's, he's imprisoned. Paul makes a bold declaration of the gospel. Paul shares his conversion story, his gospel story with everyone that will listen to him. And now we're going to pick up in chapter 22, beginning in verse 22. And if you are physically able this morning, I'm going to ask that you would stand with me. In honor of and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant, life-giving word. It says, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why uh, they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said this to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. And the tribune answered, I uh, bought this citizenship for a large sum. But Paul said, I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the tribune also was afraid for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set, before, and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood uh, by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope of the, and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a discussion arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. But the Sadducees, uh, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledged them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes and Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, or the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go uh, down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks the following night. The Lord stood by him and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus, and God, I ask that you would do what, God, only you can do through the power of your word. God, I pray that you would use it, God, to bring conviction, God, to bring comfort, God, to expose sin in our lives and to mold us and to shape us in the image of Jesus. So God, as we sit at your feet, 
And God, as we hear from you today, I pray that you would speak to your church. God, that you would equip them for the work of the ministry that is in front of us. And God, that you would comfort regardless of what is going on around us. God, we love and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There are four notes in our text that I want to highlight for us today. For those of you who brought a pen and paper and are going to follow along with me, the first thing I want you to take note of is the anger of the unbelievers. You see, verse 22 picks up on the heels of Paul sharing his testimony. But not only does it pick up on the heels of Paul sharing his testimony, it picks up on the heels of Paul sharing his testimony and how God had sent him out to the Gentiles. And I want you to notice how they respond to Paul in verse 22. Look again with me, chapter 22, verse 22. It says, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. You see, the the crowd was fine with Paul until he made mention of the mission to the Gentiles. That was the thing that triggered their anger and led them screaming at Paul and wanting to kill Paul. You see, with the mention of this one thing, we go from a Wednesday night testimony session at church to a mob-like scene where they literally wanted Paul's life to be taken from him. This was the moment Paul taught them that the ground was level at the foot of the cross. And the Jews in this moment did not like what they were hearing. Because up until this time in their life, the Jews lived as if all the promises of God were strictly for them and not for the world around them. And Paul in this moment is telling them that the Gentile mission is God's mission and that all the Gentiles who profess faith in Christ, they are the true Israel. And so Paul's Gentile mission is a bold statement that the gospel is for absolutely everyone and the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all come to the cross the same way. And so what we learn in our text is that Christianity and Judaism were not compatible. Not at this time. Not those who failed to see Jesus as the Messiah. Because the Jews would not tolerate the Christian perspective. Now look with me in verse 23 at what it says. It says, And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the, tri- uh, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. And so with just a few words, Luke here paints us an incredible picture of anger and hostility towards Paul and ultimately towards the gospel that he proclaimed. Luke gives us an incredible picture. And so here's the lesson that we draw from the first part of this text. The gospel flies in the face of the sinner and it is by nature confrontational. The gospel is confrontational. You don't get to come to Christ holding on to the life that you love. You come to Christ at the expense of the life that you love. And so the Jews couldn't hold on to their customs. They couldn't hold on to the promises of God being specifically for them and them alone. They had to come realizing that the grand redemption story of God was meant for all people in all places at all times. Francis Schaeffer said this. He said, truth carries with it confrontation. Truth demands confrontation. Loving confrontation, but confrontation nevertheless. Church, we cannot expect to proclaim a gospel that is singular and exclusive. That Jesus and Jesus alone saves. And not expect for it to be offensive to the world around us. You see, the very nature of the gospel is offensive. Now, I will add this. Christians shouldn't be offensive, but the gospel is offensive. This doesn't give all of us the right to be jerks when we share the gospel. That's that's not what this text is giving us. But the gospel is by nature confrontational. 
You see, we do not get to tell the world they are dying and they are perishing apart from Christ out of arrogance. We tell the world they are dying and they are perishing apart from Christ with tears in our eyes and love in our hearts because we know that apart from Christ, people will die and experience torment for all of eternity. These Jews were angry. They were angry enough to have Paul beaten and killed. If you and I are going to face that kind of hostility towards the gospel, and make no mistake about it, in 2022, we will, then we must be able to remember the promises of God. We must remember the promises of God because biblical Christianity is not popular. And popular Christianity will never be biblical. Verse 24 goes on to tell us they were going to put him in the barracks. They were going to have him examined by flogging him. This flogging was ordered to endure a scourging. It was a piece of leather they would take and they would take sharpened bone and they would take metal and glass and they would press it into the strap. And they would take that strap and they would beat the man or the woman with it. This was much more severe. Some of you are thinking, well, well, Paul was beat when he was in Philippi. Paul was beat with rods in Philippi. This is a different kind of beating that Paul is about to endure that's been ordered for him to endure. This kind of scourging commonly left the victim dead. This is the hatred and vitriol that Paul faced in Jerusalem. They didn't simply want him dead. They wanted him to suffer on his way to death. And this hatred wasn't over Paul's life. It wasn't over Paul's love. It was over Paul's theology. That's what this was over. And then in verse 25, Paul, in a very timely manner, points out the fact that he's a Roman citizen and that it is not lawful for him to be beat until after his trial. Then in verses 26 through 29, and I'm going to try to summarize them well, but in verses 26 through 29, Paul essentially confirms his Roman citizenship by pointing out the fact that he was born in Rome. He didn't go purchase his Roman citizenship through some shady act or through financial resources. He was born a Roman citizen. And so that halted the beating. And so the second thing to note in our text, not only do we see the anger of the unbelievers. We also see the humility of Paul. And so look with me at verse 30. It says, but on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priest and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And so he ordered that Paul meet with the Sanhedrin. That's what's going on in this moment. And so Paul is there the next day meeting with the Sanhedrin. You can imagine Paul seeing that leather whip, knowing what was coming to him, knowing what the next day could hold. It was probably a long night leading into this next day, but we read it casually in verse 30 on the next day as if there was nothing to it. Paul likely was dreading the next day. And so here we find Paul standing before the Sanhedrin. And the chief priest. And then in verse 1, Paul gives a testimony of how he has lived his life. Then in verse 2, because he says he's lived it with a clear conscience up to that day, and it angered Ananias so much so that he ordered that Paul be struck on the mouth, and he was struck in the face. But that's not the thing worth noting in the story. What follows is what is worth noting. You see, the rights of Jewish defendants were safeguarded by Jewish law. They were presumed innocent until proven guilty. They had the opposite of the Bob May effect. Okay? Bob May is my father, for you don't know that. Okay? My father assumed guilt on me when people came with accusations against me. Oh, he did it. I know he did it. All right, I was guilty until proven innocent. That's not how the American judicial system works. That's not how the Roman judicial system worked. And that's not how the Jews worked either. You were innocent until proven guilty. 
And so for the high priest to order Paul to be struck on the mouth was to break his own law. And then we look at verse three. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck? Paul here is calling out the hypocrisy of the high priest who was probably dressed in fine religious clothing. And Paul refers to him as a whitewashed wall, highlighting for all the people around him and for us that even though the priest looked outwardly clean and pure, he was actually corrupt and perverted. Paul wanted everyone to know that they were judging him according to the law. And here he is being struck contrary to the law. And so in this moment, Paul did the opposite of what Jesus did. I read a half a dozen commentaries and more on this passage. Some defended Paul's actions and said, hey, Paul had every right to highlight the law to him. Some said Paul did the opposite of what Jesus did. I'm going to tell you what happened. Paul got struck in the mouth and Paul mouthed off. That's what he did. I mean, I'm not telling you he was right for doing what he did. I'm just telling you I probably would have done the same or much worse. I mean, he's at least quoting scripture back to the high priest in this moment. I I don't know what I would be quoting if somebody was hitting me in the mouth unjustifiably. But I want you to notice what happens in verse four and five. Because this is where we really begin to see the humility of Paul standing out. Verse four goes on to say, those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Here's the thing. Paul had a momentary lapse in judgment. And he lashed out at the high priest in utter frustration. Unlike Jesus, who endured his unfair trial with restraint, Paul momentarily lost control. And Luke here doesn't try to hide the fact that Paul in raw emotions lashed out but rather Luke records for us exactly what happened. But in verse five, after realizing it was the high priest, we don't know if it was Paul's bad eyesight that led him to not know that that was the high priest who ordered the command. We don't know if it was the fact that Paul may not have, maybe his head was hung. He didn't know where the command came from. We don't know why Paul didn't recognize Ananias. I mean, Paul's been out of Jerusalem for a long time. Maybe Paul was ignorant of the fact that Ananias was the high priest. We don't know exactly why he didn't know, but he didn't know who ordered the command, or at least he didn't know that it was the high priest who did it. But in verse five, after realizing what he had done, Paul immediately repented of what he had said. This was Paul's moment of saying, I'm sorry for what I said, even if what I said was true. This is where we see humility of Paul put on display for all of us to see. He's on trial for a sin he did not commit, is being treated unfairly, was struck in the mouth because of a command given by the high priest, makes a snide comment, and then immediately turns from that comment, showing us what true humility looks like and that humility knows no bounds. Church, if you read this story quickly, you'll miss this. But if you learn nothing else from this bizarre exchange, we need to to learn this. When we mess up, we need to be quick to repent and admit it. Don't in your pride dig in deeper. I I see men do this in their marriage all the time. I may be guilty of this a time or two myself. When a quick, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that, would do, 30 minutes later, the discussion is still going on. And I realize, had I just apologized quickly, this would not be where it is right now. Paul shows us how when he realized what he had done, he quickly turned from it and admitted to it. You see, true humility is being willing to admit failure to those who have sinned against you. It's not about what they had done. Did Paul, did, 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 look, did it, was Ananias a whitewashed wall? A hundred percent. Was Ananias outwardly pure while inwardly, uh, had he perverted the law? One hundred percent. Did Paul state anything that wasn't factual? Nope, he didn't. And yet he still acknowledged the fact that he shouldn't have said it. You see, humility is is being willing to admit failure to those who have sinned against you. When I was in college, 
at Northwest. The BSU director at the time uh, was Tom McLaughlin. Tom McLaughlin, for those of you who went to Northwest BSU or have met Brother Tom, uh, you know who he is. Brother Tom wears slacks every day of his life. Button-up shirt. He's a classy man. Okay, I say classy. We're in the middle of Poland on a mission trip. It is 20 degrees outside. It is a snow blizzard unlike anything I'd ever seen in North Mississippi. We're hopping from train to train trying to get back to the church we were staying at uh, and that we were sleeping in. And Brother Tom's walking around with penny loafers on. I'm like, Brother Tom, we would all be okay with you wearing normal shoes on this trip. These are more comfortable than normal shoes. I'm like, there's no way. The best is who he is. The, my first year at Northwest, I walked in and I saw Brother Tom with gloves on. Now he's still wearing his slacks, his button up, and his penny loafers. And I see him with gloves on and the men's bathroom door open. And he's cleaning the toilets. I thought, it's odd of Brother Tom to be cleaning the toilets. So I walked up and had a conversation with him. And I don't, I don't remember any of the details of the conversation But the act itself left an impression on me. The fact that the man who was the top guy on the pole at BSU, because, I mean, we were all just college students, you know, kind of serving and trying to reach our campus with the gospel. But the guy who was number one in command of everything that we did and everything that went on, who made sure the bills were paid and took care of everything, was willing to put gloves on and go to the bathroom and clean the bathroom as well. You see, position does not nullify the need for humility. Position actually demands the need for humility in a way that most do not understand. And Paul in this moment, even though he was the leader in this church planning movement, recognized his sin, turned from it quickly, and acknowledged it was wrong. You see, Paul in this moment was not only physically exhausted, He was emotionally and spiritually exhausted as well. Tony Marita said of this passage, he said, this section of Acts points us to the all-sufficient grace of Jesus who uses wounded soldiers to accomplish his mission. The third thing to note as we continue marching through this passage is the hope of the resurrection. Look at verse six with me and what Paul says. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out, In the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee, or or a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. The phrase crying out is in the imperfect tense, which means Paul was continually crying out. He didn't just say this one time. The theme of Paul's sermon in this moment was the hope of the resurrection. Paul stood out because he believed that Jesus had been physically raised from the dead. Now, the Sanhedrin was made up of two different groups of people, mostly Sadducees and then some Pharisees. The Sadducees were the theological liberals of the day. They denied the supernatural, especially the resurrection. That's pretty much what the text goes on to tell us. They didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe in angels, and they denied all of it. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible, anything outside of that, they didn't believe. And then you had the Pharisees. They were the legalistic conservatives of the day who believed in a future resurrection. They also believed in a future Messiah who was going to come. And so Paul used his hope in the resurrection of Jesus to divide this group here and cause a riot. So Paul's theology had worked against him up until this point in time in his life. I mean, he's literally on trial because of his theology. And here Paul is about to use his theology to divide this group of people and show them that they didn't agree on everything. I mean, it really is a brilliant move on Paul's part. While at the same time, get this, talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And so Paul was not simply playing on the emotions of the crowd in this moment. Paul is pointing to the hope we have in Christ because of his bodily resurrection from the dead. Let's look at what he says when he proceeds in verse 7. And when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. 
Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, we find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from them uh, by force and bring him into the barracks. You see, the Pharisees had an ancestral hope of a resurrection. They had always been taught that a resurrection was going to come. Paul here knew the hope that he had in Jesus because of the resurrection. And so the Pharisees hoped in a future Messiah and they awaited a future resurrection from the dead. What they lacked was recognition that Jesus fulfilled both of those promises and Paul was quick to point out that Jesus was the fulfillment of their resurrection hope and they did not even know it. And so Paul is bringing up the resurrection and he's preaching this sermon about the resurrection in part because he wants to get out of there and in part because he wants to highlight their own theological divide. But I do wanna highlight something to you about the Sadducees. The Sadducees could not become a Christian unless they completely abandoned their distinct theological ideals. The only way for the Sadducee to come to faith in Jesus was to renounce their entire religious upbringing and to profess faith in Jesus. That was the only way for them to become a Christian. And so the Pharisee, who had been taught about the Messiah, who had been taught about the resurrection, could be shown how Jesus was the fulfillment of both of those promises. Because all the promises of God find their yes in Jesus. But this is where we see the gospel confronting them. You see, the gospel always confronts us on a theological level because it fundamentally changes who we are and what we believe. And it was gonna change these Sadducees' belief system if they would trust in Christ. And the resurrection for you and I is a central doctrine in our faith. We do not have hope apart from it. The empty tomb is our hope because not only did Jesus carry our sin to the cross, he conquered death by rising from the dead. And now he stands in resurrection power as the all-sufficient savior and the conquering king. Church, this was Paul's moment. And in verse 10, the crowd became so violent, they... They run in and grab Paul and they pull him out and take him back to the prison in fear that Paul was going to be torn limb from limb. I mean, can you imagine being Paul that night? The first night, things were rough. Second night, things aren't getting any better. I can imagine this was one of Paul's darkest nights of his life. What he had hoped for in coming to Jerusalem was simply not happening. He wanted to bring relief. He brought relief to a struggling church. But there was no unity coming about in this church. The church he found was compromised in its beliefs. It was full of legalism. It had a genuine dislike of Gentile Christians. The non-Christian Jews there in Jerusalem were defiantly rejecting Jesus and turning away from Christ, not turning to Christ. And Paul's desire to go to Rome was probably dwindling as well as he probably believed there's no way I'm getting out of here alive. In this moment, Paul was exhausted emotionally, physically, and spiritually. He was alone. There was no one from the Jerusalem church who was going to come and comfort Paul. He was rejected. He had been humiliated. And no one seemed to be coming. But he didn't need the church at Jerusalem. Because the fourth thing to note we find in our text is the courage from God's promise. And I want you to look with me at verse 11 at what it says. It says, The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And we read verse 11 by itself. If you just flipped open your Bible tomorrow and it turned to Acts 23 and you read verse 11, you say, Oh, I should be courageous. Take courage. I'm going to go to Rome. Is that what God's telling Paul here? No, no, no. When we read the passage in its entirety and we see the context of everything Paul has endured up until this moment, 
that after one of the darkest days of Paul's life, we find him here. And where do we find him? In the presence of Jesus. Now, some commentators try to, or commentators try to explain this away. Well, this really wasn't a physical appearing. It was a, it was a, it was a vision or something else or another. Look at what the text says. The following night, the Lord stood by him. There is no indication from the text this was simply a vision or a dream in the night. This was the physical presence of Jesus standing beside Paul in his darkest moment. Charles Spurgeon said, there is not a promise, not a word in the Bible that is not ours. In the depths of tribulation, it will comfort In the midst of waves of distress, it will cheer. When sorrows surround, it will be our helper. Church, Jesus stood by Paul, not in a vision, but physically in person. God's servants who endure much for the sake of the gospel will experience the presence of God more than we can ever imagine. And there's a lot of things we can take and learn from verse 11. I could preach an entire sermon on verse 11 next week alone. I'm not gonna do that, but we could. But without a doubt, one of the things that we pull from verse 11 is the fact that God brings comfort to those who desperately need comfort with his presence. Now, Some of you are thinking, well, Jesus has never stood by me. Matthew 28, the Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all I've commanded you. And the last line of, of, of Matthew's gospel says, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you know what allows the Christian to endure the most difficult circumstances you could ever imagine in life? It's the fact that God is with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And some of you may be thinking, but the church, the church has let me down. The Jerusalem church has let Paul down. Church will let you down. I will let you down. The people sitting around you right now will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. That's the hope of the gospel, that he is always with us. And so when the church lets you down and there is no one there to encourage you, you can find encouragement in the person of Jesus because he is more than enough. And so as we serve Christ, as we endure trials, as we face opposition with a culture that is hostile to the person and work of Jesus, we should remember that he is not just enough. He is more than enough. He is more than enough. And even though we may get fatigued, And even though we stand at the door of exhaustion, Jesus is beside us, helping us endure through life's most difficult trials as our ever-present comfort in times of need. This word, take courage, is one word in Greek. It's used five different times in the New Testament, only by Jesus. And if you've got a, way of going and mapping that out. I didn't map them all out for time's sake because I preach for 45 minutes the way it is. But in each of those five instances, the emphasis is clear. Jesus and Jesus alone gives courage to his people. Now I want you to look with me at the second part of verse 11. He says, take courage for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, that's a comfort that he's been faithful. So you must testify also in Rome. You see, God was not done with Paul yet, and he had a job for Paul to do. You see, God's comfort to Paul was not only his presence, but also his plan. Paul was going to Rome. I mean, in this moment, you got to think, Paul's thinking, I'm not getting out of Jerusalem. And here's Jesus standing by him saying, you're going to Rome, and you're going to testify about me in Rome. And and so despite all that would come at Paul over the next two years, despite all that was gonna come at him over the next two years, he could approach all of it, clinging to the promises of God that he would bear witness to those who were in Rome also. 
I started a new thing this year with my Bible reading plan. I read through the Bible in a year. Last year, I highlighted verses that stood out to me. This year, I've taken five different pens or different colors because I'm trying to be color coordinated here with my, what I'm doing. And as I'm reading the verses that I highlighted last year, I'm marking up this year with my pens. And every theme has got a different color. And so if it's a sin to avoid, I highlight it with red. I mean, it you know, just kind of goes with that. If it's a truth about the gospel or God, I'm, I'm underlining it in blue. If it's uh, just an interesting verse to note, I'm, I'm, I've got a color for that. But I've got purple. I don't know why I chose purple for that, but that's irrelevant. When I see a promise to claim, a promise to cling to, or a promise to remember, I underline it in purple. And then when I come into the sanctuary and I walk and as I pace this room and as I pray, asking God to move and bless, and as I try to root my prayer into the words of Scripture, when I get to those verses that are underlined in purple and they're promises to claim or promises to cling to, promises to remember, nothing excites my prayer time more than getting to a promise of God that I see in the Bible. Nothing. In Isaiah 43, one through two, it says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. Church, we can go through the most difficult things in life because Jesus is with us. And we can endure the most difficult things knowing God is gonna fulfill his plans for our lives. Can you imagine how this changes Paul the next day? I mean, take me back before the council. What do I care? I'm going to Rome. Beat me. You're not gonna kill me. I'm going to Rome. Do what you will with this body. God's got my soul and God's got the plan. Tony Marita said about this text, while we still have breath, we should believe that Jesus has work for us to do. Another commentary writer said that God's servants are immortal until their work is done. No servant dies a premature death. And so we can only know the promises of God and we can most feel the presence of God when we immerse ourselves in the word of God. And so I've got a few points of application and we're gonna close out or I'm going to preach for a long time. Number one, expect hostility towards the gospel of Jesus. Expect hostility towards the gospel. When I do lunch with a man and he tells me, hey, I'm, I'm just not a believer yet, but I'm working through this, that tells me that God is softening and God is at work. Because if God's not softening and God's not at work, the response isn't going to be, I want to hear more about Jesus. The response is going to be hostility towards Jesus. Number two, admit when you're wrong and repent quickly. This will help you in life. It'll help you in your marriage. Admit when you're wrong and repent quickly. Number three, place your hope in the resurrection of Jesus. Church, we can endure all that life throws at us and we can stare death in the face knowing that the one who we have our hope in has defeated death. And he has conquered it. And last but certainly not least, take courage by clinging to the promises of God. Many of you walk through the doors this morning and I have no idea where you are. I have no idea what's going on in your life, what has gone on this past week, month, the past year, the past few years. No idea. but you can take courage. You can take courage by clinging to the promises of God that we find in his word. And so as we enter into a time of invitation and you've come today and you've heard about the promise of God that he is with us, you see how he's able to help Paul endure through all of these things and you think, I don't know the promises of God, I don't know the gospel, but I want to know it. The invitation is for you to come this morning. There are men and women around this room who would love to take you to another room and show you with an open Bible what it looks like to repent and believe. And for those of you who are believers who are simply struggling 
who have had a difficult season, or maybe you're in the middle of a difficult season, find comfort that only comes from the presence of Jesus. And so I'm gonna pray and just give you an opportunity to respond. This altar is open. There are men and women around this room who would love to share the gospel with you. I'm gonna pray and give you that opportunity to respond. Father, I, I love you and I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for how it convicts. I thank you for how you use it to bring comfort in the lives of believers. And Father, I pray that as we take just a few moments and as we reflect on the truths that we've heard from your word today, I pray that you would use them to comfort those that are struggling. I pray that you would use your word, God, to draw unbelievers to yourself during this time. God, I pray that Jesus would be made much of in our response. So God, move in this place.